Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our service this morning. Uh, our number is a bit light, but we have two young uh, members, uh, and I, I take it grandchildren? Yeah. Right. Uh, from, uh, from where? We, we give you a warm welcome to our service uh, this morning. And uh, yes, our, our numbers are light, aren't they? Um, not too many notices today, except that uh, next Wednesday is scheduled the, um, uh, the weekly prayer meeting and you are all uh, welcome to it. And uh, he's not here today, but um, a young lad named Ian Rutherford has a birthday tomorrow, so um, and I think he's a little bit younger than what uh, Alistair was last week, who admitted to 24. So Ian must be about 23 then, I suppose. <laughs> so, uh, but um, if you tuned in, uh, Ian, we give you uh, birthday greetings for tomorrow, and may God bless you. And I'll now hand over to Graham. Thank you, Keith. I just draw your attention to this notice. I've put up a notice on the door, but the churches of Whitehorse are going to have a week of prayer. The theme is One Heart, and it's in the week 17th uh, to the 21st of May. And it's at 7.30 in the evening, and the first session is on, June, in, on Zoom with Red Church, and then each weeknight uh, the, there's a gathering at a different church. The details are on the notice. If you would like to be involved, uh, you have just go to the website and log on. Now shall we begin our service by singing God's praise in hymn 601, O God, our help in ages past. invite you to stand fast for a minute. It is Anzac Day and we're just going to have a minute's silence uh, and then we'll have our prayer of approach. Let us uh, stand silent.
They shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. Please be seated. Our prayer of approach, shall we just unite our hearts and join in prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, as we come to you, creatures of time and sense, knowing that our lives are like a tale that is told, and that we appear in the morning mist, like a mist and are soon gone. We bend before you this morning to recall that the freedoms we enjoy are precious, hard won, and that many people around the world are denied freedom to gather and liberty of conscience. And this morning we pause to give thanks to you for those who have been called to serve in time of war. We remember the Anzac generation, men and women, black and white, who served in the Great War, that war to end wars, especially those who did not grow old. We pray for all families who have been stricken by war and the chaos into which it drags unsuspecting families and communities. Thank you for the work of legacy and we pray for all ex-service men and women from whichever war who suffer post-traumatic stress disorder. Bring peace to troubled souls, we pray. We lament that wars continue, and as we pray for justice and peace among the nations, we pray for those who today may be in harm's way in their service of our country. We pray for the great flood of displaced people and all seeking refuge from war as they move about the nations seeking safety, bring them to situations of calm, we know, Lord Jesus, that you came to set the oppressed free and to declare that the time had come when the Lord would save his people. So, O oh Lord, create a generation of peacemakers who hunger and thirst for what is right, who are as harmless as doves and as wise as serpents. Cause the knowledge of the Lord to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Begin by working in your church this morning, even here. Bring glory to your name among the nations, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, Christine is going to bring us young at heart. Thank you, Christine. Good morning. Mm, I hope you can hear me. It seems to me that wherever we have lived, we've had good neighbours. In our current house, which is on a through road, we've only got to know well the neighbours behind us and beside us. It's been harder to get to know anyone further afield, but fortunately these families are kind and caring people. Tim Sharp, who runs a psychology practice called the Happiness Institute, conducted a study which found that 77% of Australians never talk to the people next door and know very little about them. More than half couldn't tell you their neighbours' names and 25% wouldn't recognise their faces if they crossed paths in the local community. In 1999, Rosemary Kariyuki, yeah, this beautiful, colourful lady, arrived in Australia as a refugee from Kenya, fleeing family and tribal violence. Initially, she lived in a block of six units, I think in Sydney. She was taken aback by the lack of interaction between neighbours living in the same block of flats. So at Christmas time, 
She put a card in each mailbox with a few details about herself. The transformation began. Everyone started talking to their neighbours. In January this year, Rosemary was named Local Hero of the Year. She's done a lot more since she first posted those cards into her neighbours' mailboxes. She is known as Big Mama Rosemary, and she is big, in Sydney's western suburbs. And the honour you see her receiving in that photograph was for her outstanding work helping other migrant women overcome the scourge of isolation. Rosemary herself was very lonely in her early years in Australia, but she always knew that God was with her. It was faith which gave me that strength to leave Kenya and come here, she said. I was coming to a country I didn't know, and I didn't know anyone else here. So she made sure she prayed before she took the chance. One thing I prayed about, and I'll never forget, first of all, when I wanted to leave Kenya, I prayed, take me to a country, God, you know me how I am. Take me to that country where you know I will fit in, she said. And when I arrived in Australia, I said, Oh, thank you, God. You have just given me what I prayed for. Her current role is Multicultural Community Liaison Officer for the Parramatta Police. And she specialises in helping migrants who are facing domestic violence, language barriers and financial distress. She's also an active member of her parish in Western Sydney. I won't go into all she has done to help migrant women. There's lots about her on the internet and she has especially encouraged dance, which is very important to migrant women. She's encouraged people to share their concerns, make trips out of Sydney, and simple things like picnics in the park. The documentary Rosemary's Way is due to be released in June, but this weekend in the classic cinema in Elstonwick, today, tomorrow and Tuesday, it's having preview showings. Rosemary says her faith was number one and that she's a prayerful person. Before I do anything, I always pray about it and I also meditate about it and put God first. Even before we travel, on that day, I pray, we pray. When the women are going through issues, I always say, put God number one. So, my Christian faith has played a big part in what I do. Her, great, her story is a great encouragement to us that God can bring good out of the harvest, hardest situations. Being forced to flee one's country, and I know, Geza, that you've experienced this, must be one of the hardest experiences. In Romans 8, 28, we read, We know that in all things God works for good for those who love him, those whom he has called according to his purpose. May he enable us all to put him first and be the blessing and share the blessings that Rosemary has experienced. Thank you, Christine. Quite a remarkable woman is Rosemary. Uh, 
as Christine was preparing it, I read a little bit about her and discovered that it's amazing the number of migrant women that never leave the house. You know, just going out to the pic for a picnic in the park makes a massive difference. Well, our Bible reading today will be read by me. And it comes from Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 2, from the beginning. When the day of Pentecost came, all the believers were gathered together in one place. Suddenly, there was a noise, like a strong wind blowing, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they saw what looked like tongues of fire which spread out and touched each person there. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to talk in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. There were Jews living in Jerusalem, religious men who had come from every country in the world. When they heard the noise, a large crowd gathered. They were all excited because each one of them heard the believers speaking in his own language. In amazement and wonder, they exclaimed, These people who are talking like this are Galileans. How is it then that all of us hear them speaking in our own native language? We are from Parthia, Media, and Elam, from Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, from Pontus and Asia, from Phrygia and Pamphylia, from Egypt and all the regions near Libya, near Cyrene. Some of us are from Rome. Both Jews and Gentiles converted to Judaism, and some of us are from Crete and Arabia. Yet all of us hear them speaking in our own language about the great things that God has done. Amazed and confused, they kept asking each other, what does this mean? But others made fun of the believers, saying, These people are drunk. Then Peter stood up with the other eleven apostles and in a loud voice began to speak to the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, listen to me and let me tell you what this means. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. Instead, this is what the prophet Joel spoke about. And we'll leave the reading there. And may God bless uh, the reading and the reflection on his word this morning. You will now be waited on for your free will offering. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that we can bring our gifts and ask that we might present not only what we have offered, but indeed ourselves in your service. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The hymn is number 248, Jesus Stand Among Us, In Thy Risen Power.
Well, this morning we're turning to Acts chapter 2. The uh, story which we've just read is the beginning of that chapter. And we got as far as Peter about to explain what, what was going on. I thought it might be helpful for all of us just to see something visual uh, from the Bible project to help log into what's going on here before I speak about it. I'm going to, I'm going to play this slide then, uh, which is about Acts 1 to 7, and I'm going to stop it part way through, so it will be a little bit abrupt. And I'm actually going to fidget with it so that uh, I can get the subtitles as well. So I invite you to uh, watch and uh, learn a little from this video. So that's an introduction to uh, Acts 1 to 7. And I want to, to just leave it there. Uh, next week we'll think a little bit more about the outcome at the end of the chapter. But today I've, I've put the heading like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread. And I want to think about three things. I want to think about the wind and the fire. And I want to look at Peter's explanation. And then I want to think about the change that Peter calls for, that we should receive the gifts that God has given. So let's think first of all about the wind and fire. The, the word pente, 
means 50. So Pentecost is a festival which comes 50 days after Passover. So at the Passover, Jesus shared the meal with his disciples, but that weekend he was executed. Uh, then on the first day of the week, he rose from the dead, and over 40 days he appeared to them. And he, they were convinced by many, for many reasons uh, that he was alive and he was teaching them things and about his upside down kingdom and now he has left them. They've seen him disappear and it's just been extraordinary. But he told them to wait, to wait in Jerusalem uh, and you will receive power. And so Pentecost has come and Pentecost gathers uh, Jewish people from all around the world. Remember that Jewish people had been in captivity here. They'd sought refuge in Egypt. Some of them had gone north and west. And so all over the Mediterranean world, there were Jewish people. And as I read the names, what we heard was basically uh, uh, going right around the world. Tourists, not, well, I suppose they were tourists. They were actually pilgrims. They hadn't come to take selfies. They'd come to, uh, to celebrate the, the beginning of the harvest because uh, Pentecost was the start of the harvest festival and they've come to Pentecost, uh, to, to Jerusalem at Pentecost and now uh, some strange things are happening. There are 120 disciples of Jesus. There's the 12, there's Mary the mother of Jesus, there's a, a group of women who have been following him and there are others who have, who have joined the group and uh, and there's a noise, and it sounded like wind, but it actually wasn't wind. It sounded like it, but it wasn't. And then there was what seemed like tongues of fire. It wasn't fire, it just resembled fire. And then there was speech and languages, which were kind of other languages. I know, you know what it's like when you hear people talking a language you don't understand, and it sounds like a kind of gobbledygook. Uh, that's a universal experience. We think it's when people don't speak our language, but it's whenever we, we, people don't hear their own language spoken, they have to try and think, well, which language is that? And that's what they were saying. Well, you know, we're from all these different places and we're hearing these different languages. So, so what does it mean? Well, some mocked and said they must be drunk, you know. But Peter stands up and says, no, he deals with that. No, of course, it's, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. You know, it's no chance for that. I'll tell you what this is, he says, and he comes back to this idea and he explains what we're seeing in a very particular way. He says, that sound like a strong wind, that blowing, that gale force wind, that wildfire, the spread is the Holy Spirit, and they started speaking in different languages. What was it all about? Well, God the Spirit has always been through the Bible. The first verses of the Bible are about God the Holy Spirit. This was not news. The, the idea of God the Spirit wasn't news. The, the first verses of the Bible say that the Spirit of God brooded over the waters, moved across the waters, and God said, let there be. So the Spirit represents the, the presence and the power of God. And Jewish people knew that. And they knew that the Spirit was present in the lives of people here and there throughout their history, especially uh, it, the, uh, priests and kings and prophets and, and other individuals here and there were touched by something that made them stand out. So what Peter is saying, that what's happening on Pentecost is that day. The wind was the Holy Spirit, but not just for kings and prophets now, but for all God's children, men and women, young and old. It doesn't matter. They will proclaim my message. And then the tabernacle and the temple. Uh, there's a, a lovely discussion uh, in a sermon by Bishop Tom Wright. And he's, he says this, just thinking about the fire, what seemed like fire. He, he says uh, that fire we, is dangerous, right? So we keep it in its place. Imaginatively, we call that place the fireplace. Most homes have a fireplace because we keep it there because it's dangerous. Now, when God touched earth, as it were, it was a moving thing. Heaven and earth coming together 
at Sinai and the top the mountain was there was fire and smoke and there was darkness and there was fear and then later on God made his presence in the midst of the people as they were camping and moving through the Sinai God's tent was in the middle we call it the tabernacle or the sacred tent or it's got different names in different translations but basically God was on the move because the people were on the move and God was in the middle of the camp because they were his people and that place was marked out by a column of fire and the place in Jerusalem in Jesus day where God's presence touched earth was the temple that was where God was regarded as having his place there was an empty room there which had in it in the most holy place the covenant box with God's promise to be with his people and so here is the fire but but now what's happening is that it's kind of bursting out Tom Wright says this in ancient Israel the place where temp- heaven and earth met uh, was the temple the spot on earth where heaven actually overlapped earth and the temple thus functioned to the rest of Israel rather like the fireplace functions in a living room with the place where that which is normally dangerous can safely be located and dealt with but if you think of the temple as the fireplace providing warmth and light to the room while being in a safe spot then the imagery of pentecost stands out in all its darkness here are the tongues of fire touching down not on the temple or the priests about their normal activities but on the disciples in the upper room the fire has leapt out of the fireplace and it seems to be setting light to the rest of the house so it's a dramatic moment this pentecost has changed the the whole history of the world and we'll talk more about that especially next week and so one other thing that i want to pick up and that is way back in the first book of the bible there's the story of the tower of babel you remember human arrogance said we will build up to heaven we will build a tower we'll show how how good we are how great we are and it says the lord god caused a diversity of languages and they couldn't talk to each other and the whole thing fell into disrepair and the nations were scattered now what's happening is the languages the message of god is being heard in all of these languages and the command is to gather the nations together to bring them to share the message so there's a reversal of what happened at babel is to happen now and all of this comes out of the prophecy of joel this is because jesus kept driving his disciples back to the old testament remember how he talked about it in luke 24 volume 1 of luke's writings at the end he opened the old testament to the disciples so they could start to understand it and and as so peter is saying to the crowd that all of this is happening through jesus jesus of nazareth and he he mentions specifically a man approved by god and known to you and he talks about his life and ministry in verse 22 they didn't need any introduction he was the talk of the town it wasn't so long since he'd been crucified and there were rumors about him being alive and his grave was empty and nobody knew where the body was and what was going on so his life and ministry were well known and he'd been handed over to be killed and perhaps some of some of those in the crowd had been there that day calling for his life so there was a kind of implication that these people may well have been among those who called for him to be du- killed and then peter moves from joel's prophecy that these phenomena these strange things are a mark of the end the the uh, fulfillment of god's purposes coming with the the last days he turns to psalm 16 psalm which uh, has a special resonance for christine and me because we had it sung at our wedding uh, and it, it's a very beautiful psalm it's about it's a psalm which talks about 
uh, the joy which is, is, is ahead for, the, for, for David. He imagines a, a glorious future, but he imagines something that's beyond human experience. And so, so as, as uh, Peter quotes this psalm, just let me pick, you the, pick out the words that Peter quotes. I saw the Lord always before me at all times. He's near me and I will not be troubled. And so I am filled with gladness and my words are full of joy. And I, mortal though I am, will rest assured in hope because you will not abandon me. You will not let your faithful servant decay in the grave. Now, how could David say that? Well, Peter himself says, David's grave is here today. It's Mark. We know where David was buried. So who, of whom was David speaking? And he says he was speaking about Jesus. And so he goes on from there and he talks about Psalm 110. This is probably the most quoted psalm in the, in the New Testament. Uh, it's a psalm in which David is speaking to his Lord and he says, The Lord said unto my Lord. And so suddenly David's descendant is his Lord. How did that work out? How did it work out unless there was something unique about a particular descendant of David? And that person was indeed the Messiah. I won't go into the detail now, but you can read that, that psalm. Uh, it's quoted in Peter's sermon in verse 34. It was not David who went up into heaven. Rather, he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies as a footstool for your feet. So here is Peter drawing on the scriptures, on Joel and on the Psalms, to make it clear to these Jewish people that the days have come when God's purposes are reaching their fulfillment. His salvation has come. And the world is going to be different from this time on. One of the key verses which I, which I like at the beginning is when Peter says, these men are not drunk like you suppose, and then he says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. If you look at Joel, you'll find it in 2.32. And we're told that this, these are the last days. This is a promise of the end time. And so, in a sense, the end time has begun. From the time of the ascension of Christ until the end of time, we're living in what the New Testament calls the last days. Now, the, uh, the gift that uh, is being offered is the gift of the Spirit. And we're told that it's for all God's people, as I've already said. It's not just for priests and prophets. It's for men and women, young and old. And the message is that the Messiah has arrived. Not only has Messiah arrived, the Messiah is Jesus. Let us make no mistake about this. That one who was crucified, that one who was the talk of the town, that one of whom you know very well, he's arrived. And not only that, he's come with gifts. He's not come for revenge. He's come with gifts. And his gifts are the gift of the Spirit for all of God's people. So what, what is God calling us to here? Well, he's calling for a new direction, a change. And the change that happened swept out and I think the visuals from the Bible Project uh, little film capture it really well, that the city of Jerusalem was changed and Judea and Samaria were changed and the message radiated out and the empire was changed. The empire fought against this thing that was happening. But in the end, the empire capitulated and the emperor threw his lot in with the Christians because he could see that this was going to be the winning side. This was taking over the world. What was it? It was a new kind of power. It wasn't the power of the sword. It was the power of a capacity to love and to serve. What a strange power that is. And uh, this is, I'm just uh, going to show you a some of us are old enough to remember a band called the second chapter of Acts. I'm not going to play the music. I was tempted, but I'm not going to. I'll just skip over that. And these three young people, well, they were young when they started, discovered that they're, the oldest of them is uh, 
same age as me and Christine. <laughs> but in 1970, uh, they were young and they formed a band called the Second Chapter of Acts and they were active till 1988. And they had a great uh, harmony between them. It was uh, two sisters and a brother. And, and they were pushing the idea and, and this, is, this is the theme. They discovered the message of the second chapter of Acts and that's what they called themselves. But we'll skip right past that and we'll come to the word that Peter uses, repent. Now repent sounds really like a religious word. But what it really means is change your mind. Now changing our minds is sometimes really difficult. We, we, we've got a certain way of thinking and we have to slow down, and think about what's happening and what we're being invited to do, and to recalibrate how things are. Change your mind. And forgiveness and the Holy Spirit are being offered to you and to me. And so the sign of forgiveness is to receive baptism. Now the Jews baptized Gentiles when they became Jews. But Jewish people didn't get baptized. That wasn't on their agenda. But it became the mark of the Christian agenda. A little further on, we looked at the passage about the Ethiopian eunuch some weeks back. Uh, it comes a little further on in Acts chapter uh, 8. And uh, he was reading Isaiah the prophet, remember? And when he, when he got to that point where he said, uh, well, why can't I be baptized? He believed, he believed in Jesus. It was kind of obvious to him. He was possibly returning after Pentecost, you see. He'd been uh, up for the festival and was going back. And why can't I? And he could be baptized because they found water. And so here is the offer to us. And the gift is for you and for your children and for all who are afar off, to everyone who the Lord our God calls to himself. God's promise is to you and to your children. And we should make that promise our own. We should do that even now as we pray. So let us come to prayer. And, and as we pray this morning, I'm going to, I want to remember particularly that uh, Keith will be attending his sister's funeral this week and we want to remember you uh, and that service, Keith, and pray that it will be a blessing to all who are there as uh, you remember Mona and are drawn closer to God. And we remember that it's Anzac Day and that uh, there will be people around our country remembering lost loved ones and uh, always remember the impact of War is not just on individuals, but it hits families as well. And it's not just the loss of people, but it's the damage that happens in people's lives. So with those words of preamble, let me lead you in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we bow before you today, we're filled with thankfulness for your love and generosity toward us. In the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, you have freely forgiven the sins of all who humbly come in his name. And for his sake you grant the gift of your presence day by day, as by the Spirit you live in your people. Forgive us those things we have done that we ought not to have done. And forgive those things which we have left undone which we ought to have done. Keep us in step with your spirit, we pray. As you empowered those first believers to witness the truth as it is in Jesus, so strengthen us in our day to be unafraid and unashamed of him. Please cleanse us from our sins. Renew us with your Holy Spirit. Refresh us from your word and lead us in the way everlasting. We've been reminded again this week that the COVID-19 virus is dangerous and wreaking havoc in many countries. Please help those countries where the virus is raging. We think especially of India and Brazil and Turkey, but recognize other nations are struggling and are often overlooked by mainstream media. We pray that vaccine nationalism will not blight the international community 
We pray for our poorer neighbours in the Pacific, ground especially that PNG will quickly get the one million Pfizer-BioNTech vaccines requested by our Prime Minister and promised by the EU. Grant that the vaccine rollout in Australia will gather pace so that the most vulnerable will get protection before winter. We pray for your church, which suffers in so many nations of the earth. We think of Christian people oppressed in North Korea, China, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan and many other nations. We are also concerned at the prevalence of human traffic, trafficking and exploitation and we yearn for wisdom and justice to prevail in the deliberations of the nations. We're concerned for the health of Alexei Navalny and for the safety Allah, or for the families of the Indonesian submariners. Week by week we are reminded of our own mortality as we hear the passing of men and women, young and old. We've mentioned Mona's passing and we ask that that service will be a tribute to her and point all who are there to the Lord Jesus. We know that some losses are highlighted in the media and some we bear privately. So Lord, address us as you see our needs. In each case, we ask that you bring comfort to the grieving and peace to every heart that has stayed on you. We pray for those who are in hospital or receiving care for troubling illnesses of body and mind. In the stillness of this moment, we lift them to you in our hearts. May the testimony of your people bring to all such the reassurance that they are precious in your sight. Give encouragement to your servants everywhere in whatever language Jesus is made known. Follow with your blessing the proclamation of the gospel. All this we ask in the name of the Lord Jesus, who taught us to pray together and say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 131. The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory. Hymn 131. <laughs>
grace, mercy and peace from Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you and with those whom you love today and every day. Thank you.